Dr. C. Peter Wagner with us. That's, that's worthy of a, of a hallelujah. Dr. C. Peter Wagner. Um, and uh, Peter Wagner is, uh, there's, I don't think there's anyone like him. He's uh, incredibly uh, impacted the church as we know it. And um, from church growth to now what I believe is really just a, a, a mandate. He's, he's in his 80s. And he's still going. He's like the Energizer Bunny. He just, it just, keep, he's got a, he just keeps going and going and going. But he's got a, new, a fresh mandate to bring language to the rise, the establishment of the Alliance of Apostolic Centers which I believe is going to be the framework for the greatest revival that will ever come to the earth. It's the connection of the, of, the, of the body of Christ. It's the connectedness which brings the equipping, it brings the mandate, and it brings the implementation of kingdom power and authority. The church, the ecclesia, connected globally. It's pretty amazing. And it's all done through, you know, the church... The scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2 that the church of Jesus Christ is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And we're in this place of the apostles, the prophets, the implementation of what is to take place in this time to see the revival, the revival, the great revival. But there has to be a connectedness. Somebody say connectedness. There has to be a connection. There has to be, there has to be there in order for this to happen. So, I want you to uh, stand with me, and I want you to honor Dr. C. Peter Wagner as he comes and he shares this afternoon. Yeah, Hallelujah! Come on. Is this on? Is this on? Is it on? Come check it out, Matt. Here we go. It's on. Okay. There we go. Here we go. Hey. Hey. Well, I can tell thank you very much for that <clears throat> introduction, Jeff. I can tell you one thing building on that. There's not another person in the world like Jeff Chance. Yes. <laughs> because God has made us all as individuals with our own with the destiny and the assignment that he's given us and as we as we mature into what God has called us to be there's no one else like us but we all need each other That's right. and uh, so we form a team and it's really a delight for me to be here with Global Fire and um, this incredible apostolic network and I've had the <clears throat> privilege of along with Chuck Pierce of commissioning Jeff and uh, in our apostolic network called Global Spheres, commissioning him as an apostle. And so I don't like, when I come into a new place like this, I don't like to hear people call him Pastor Jeff. That's the old season. <laughs> come on, he's Apostle Jeff now. So, uh, Keep, just keep that, just keep that in mind. And uh, I like that idea because he's the father of Global Fire Network, and uh, I'm the fa I'm the father of Global Spheres, so I'm grandfather of <laughs> Global Fire Network. Grandpa, grandpa father, yeah. Grandpa, gra grandpa apostle. And um, <laughs> what I what 
I feel the Lord has led me to do this afternoon is to uh, talk about our domin what I like to call our dominion mandate. And they, that may be new terminology for some of you, but um, I'll, it, it won't be new an hour from now. You'll, you'll, get, you'll get used to it. And uh, because I feel that this is really part of the future. And I believe that um, Global Fire and uh, everything that's being done here with Jeff and his team is a very, very important part of a, of, of a new season that the body of Christ is now in. And I'm talking about historically, I'm talking about going back to the book of Acts, going back to the New Testament. This is, this is a historic time. And I'm not just trying to play with words about historic, but um, in, in, in this, what, this movement that we're part of now, we can really trace it back to around 1900. And that's not just Azusa Street, it's, it has to do with the uh, development of African independent churches. So it started in Africa, mostly, and, and, uh, but now we here in America are, have begun to tune in. Um, well, I, I don't want to go through the whole history now. Maybe I'll come to that later. But it's, it's, it's fairly new. So when we talk about 2,000 years of Christian history, see the big picture? And then we're only talking about the last maybe 1,500. It's, it's, a, new, it's a new season. And it's accelerating. It's getting, it's getting greater and greater. And uh, God has, has begun to show us new things, uh, not new for him, but things that we haven't, most of us haven't come from in our traditions about um, what you see up here about our uh, dominion mandate. And um, I'll get to that in a minute. First of all, I know a lot of you are looking intensely at my left ear, wondering what that bandage could be about. If you're like me, you know, you, you wonder about it. So I don't want to leave you wondering about that for the next hour. <laughs> I think it was three weeks ago, I had some cancer surgery on my ear. And that's, that's since, think about that, peeling cancer off from the inside of your ear. I don't mean the canal, I mean the inside of your outer ear. And what, because I've had another, a lot of other cancer surgeries for skin cancer. And um, they can usually sew them up, but they can't sew your ear up. How are you going to sew an ear up? When you take all that skin out from the inside, there's no skin left. So it takes a long time to heal. So anyway, that's, that's the story behind the bandage on my ear, in case you're wondering, which most of you are, have been. Now you're not wondering anymore. <laughs> yeah, now you, know, now you know. So um, I'm almost ready to start teaching about our dominion mandate, but not quite, because I brought this joke along. <laughs> this is, this is, I, I've got a, quite a collection of jokes. In fact, I got a whole book out on jokes called "Let's Laugh." You can get it on Amazon, and. Uh, uh, anyhow, this is uh, one of my subsections is religious jokes. So this is a religious joke. And you're going to, speaking of that, you know, did you ever think, this isn't, isn't, this isn't part of my talk, but did you, do you know who the Apostle Paul's father was? Say no. 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 Well, I can tell you. It was the, the, um, Thief on the cross. Really? Because, yeah, because Paul said, my old man was crucified with Christ. <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> that wasn't the joke. This is the joke. 
Okay, you're going to love this. You ready for this? Say yes. Yeah. All right. Mildred, the church gossip and self-appointed monitor of the church's morals, kept sticking her nose into other people's business. Several members of the church didn't approve what she was doing, but they feared her enough to maintain their silence. And most of the time, she got her way. Mildred met her match, however, when she accused Henry, a new church member, of being an alcoholic. After she saw his old pickup truck parked in front of the town's only bar one afternoon, Mildred emphatically told Henry, as well as several others, that anyone seeing his truck there would know exactly what he was doing. Henry, a man of few words, stared at her for a moment. Then he just turned around and walked away. He didn't explain, defend, or deny. He said nothing. Later that evening, Henry quietly parked his pickup truck in front of Mildred's house, walked home, and left it there all night. <laughs> Well, you gotta love Henry. <laughs> Which brings us to our Dominion mandate. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right, let's. Um, uh, incidentally, I'm coordinating this with my assistant, Brandon. This, this, we're not wired for me to change the screen. I think. Where's Brandon? Where are you, Brandon? Oh, there you are, behind that one, TV. It's the first time we tried this, isn't it? Okay. Wish us well. <laughs> Here we go. Now, let's, uh, by way of introduction, let's look at the title. And there are two words, dominion and mandate. So the, first of all, let's take a look at that word, see that word mandate? A mandate is, is an authoritative order or command. That's what that means. And so in this case, this is an order from our commander-in-chief, who is Jesus Christ. And it's a command to the body of Christ. And um, I like the way, what, the, the way that we were thinking before, that Jesus is in heaven at the, at, at the right hand of God the Father, but his body is where? It's on the earth. And uh, it's a command from Jesus to his body. This is not, not a suggestion. It's not good advice. It's a command. And like any command that anybody receives, once they, have a, once they get a command, they have a choice, don't they? Choice is whether they're going to obey it or not obey it. And um, so that's what I mean by Mandate. Now, let's take the word dominion. See, dominion means control or rulership or authority. It means to subdue. And what I'm, what I'm talking about here this afternoon, this re now relates to our society. And it relates to the prayer of Jesus, which, we, which Jeff just led us in a little while ago, where Jesus taught us to pray our Father, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, where? On earth as it is in heaven. That's right. And um, just before I forget to tell you, because I frequently do, I've got a whole book, one of my newest books is on this, called, uh, called On Earth As It Is in Heaven, the whole end of that prayer. And actually what I'm going to teach about is also in this book with a lot more. So if anybody's, wants to go further into what I'm introducing this afternoon, just get that um, book. You can get my book. Some of them are in the bookstore, I noticed, but this one didn't. Jeff said he is, was new for that. And so I'll give you a, that copy, Jeff. Good, thank you. And um, you, can, you, can, you can still get all these on Amazon if you're interested in it. Okay, 
So when it says, when it, I say this relates, this dominion relates to society, I mean it's talking about Jesus' body, the body of Christ, right? Being the head and not the tail of the society in, in which we live. So the dominion mandate actually is another word for the Great Commission. Yes. Now, let me, let me explain something here that's not up here on the, on the screen. Um, there's, there's more than one. We can find the Great Commission in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. But and it came from Jesus. But the two, the two main ones are Matthew and Mark. And when anybody asks, like, the body of Christ, what is the Great co Commission? Well, first of all, everybody agrees that we should fulfill a Great Commission. I never heard anybody disagree with that. But then we say, well, what is the Great Commission? And most people just say um, the way that Mark has it, and they're the, they're the words of Jesus as well. You know, go into all the world and preach the gospel to... Yeah, all creation or every creature, right? So as soon as we think about preaching the gospel to every creature, we're thinking individuals. And this is true. This is this is this is one of this is Jesus' command. But then a lot of people don't go, don't think more broadly of that, and think of the quote that Matthew has of Jesus where it gives a, a little different emphasis. And this is what I want to stress today. And you know this scripture, but I just want to make sure that you, you take a look at it. If you can see that up there on the screen. He says, this, is where, this is where he says to his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. See that word nations? So in other words, that's corporate. Uh, Mark is individual, see that? And Matthew is corporate. Make disciples of nations. Now, nations include individuals, but they're the whole social group. And it doesn't have to be necessarily nations, the geopolitical nations that we have today. Although it can, it could, but it could mean a city. It could mean Murfreesboro. It could mean Nashville. It could mean the state of Tennessee. It could mean uh, America. And do you think it's possible that America could be a disciple of Jesus Christ, the nation? I think so. That's what that's what we're that's what we're preaching. I mean, you got Dutch. We got Dutch sheets coming for three sessions. You'll hear that in every one of the sessions, and uh, tell it in different ways. But America can be a nation, which could be de described as a disciple of Jesus. And the nation of America proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Lord of this nation. And that's what. That's that's. I, I'm not making this up. I'm just taking that. It uh, this, this is the Great Commission in Matthew, 28. So that's that's. You know that's why I don't know if you ever thought of it this way, but you know that what I'm saying is true. When Jesus sent out his disciples, like the records we have in the Bi in the Bible, when Jesus sent out his disciples, he never sent them out to preach the gospel of the church. That's right. Figure it out. He never sent them out to preach the gospel of salvation. That's right. He always sent them out to preach the gospel of kingdom. Now, does the kingdom include the church? Yes. Yeah. Does it include salvation? Absolutely. Yes. It's all. Good. But the kingdom is a much bigger command or mandate than uh, than uh, than than anything else. So when we talk about the gospel of the kingdom. What are we talking about? Well, we, you, you've heard this preached many times. You're talking about healing the sick, talking about casting out demons, talking about saving souls, talking about multiplying churches, talking about caring for the poor, and you're talking about transforming society. Yeah. Now, that last line, transforming society, is new to a lot of us because a lot of us haven't come, we've come from the tradition of individual Great Commission, but not corporate. Great Commission. See where I'm going yeah. with this? Okay. So that's, where, that, that's, that, that's what we're going to do. And so this is our dominion mandate. Now I'm going to want to make this as simple as possible. So I've reduced it to 
um, what I call f just four points to remember to get the whole pictures, as far as I, I can give it this afternoon, of uh, what the Dominion Mandate is. Okay, so there, f there, there are four, and uh, I'll go a little bit slow on these titles. Some of you are see are taking notes, and um, the first one, number one, is Dominion theology begins on the first page of the Bible. Okay? And so I think it must be important. It begins with Adam and Eve. And we all know the story. I don't have to dwell on that. But what we know for a beginner is that God created the whole universe. I mean, the whole universe. Here it I've, I've lived a long time, and during my lifetime, many, many times it was made headline news uh, when, when some scientists invent a new telescope, which is always more powerful than any one that's ever been invented. And every time they have invented one of these new telescopes, they scientists find out that the universe is bigger than they thought it was. Do you think they're through inventing telescopes? No. no. Actually, when it comes down to it, nobody even knows how big the universe is. And God created that whole thing. It's just, it's, yeah, it's way beyond our imagination. But it doesn't have to be because I'm not dwelling with the whole universe from here on. I'm just developing like a little speck of dust in the whole universe, which we call planet Earth. And uh, that's, that's what we're concerned with right now. And um, so you know, why, let's, let's try, to, try to figure out why did God create the earth? And you, you know this, I'm just bringing it to mind. But um, you know, he created land and he created gravity and he created light and darkness. <coughs> he created, <coughs> excuse me, an atmosphere with oxygen that we could breathe, and he created temperature, and he created plants, and he created animals, and all these things, all, a whole bunch of other things as well. But then the last thing he created was human beings. And that's the first thing he created in his image. That's right. Okay. Now, I want to make sure that we understand that how important it is to think about the fact that human beings were in God's image. And I want to make sure that we understand up front some of the things that that means. Okay? First of all, <clears throat> it means that being in God's image, they could communicate with God. Okay? And uh, secondly, that they, because they could communicate with God, they could have a personal relationship with God and love him. Get, that, get the idea? Talking about human beings now. Okay. Now, I, I set this up for number three. Because this is going to be, I'm going to repeat this several times. Adam and Eve were what we call free moral agents. Now, look at that. Look at those words. Free moral agents. In other words, that means that they were free to make their own decisions. And this had to be the case. Because, now you can figure this out, can you ever force another person to love you? If, you've, if you do f think you're forcing somebody, it can never be true love, right? Where does that love has to come, have to come from? It has to come from the person to express that love. Well, it's the same with, with God. If human, human beings are created so that they could love God, but they had to have the choice. Free moral agents because God couldn't make anybody love him. Now I want to just make sure that, that, that we get that picture because a lot more I'm going to say it, uh, depends on that. So God created the earth. We said what, The question was why did he create the earth? Mainly so he could have humans whom he could love and who could love him back and have that relationship of Mutual love, which most of us have experienced, and a whole lot of people in the world haven't experienced that yet. So that's one of the, one of the things that we're 
we're aiming for. Okay, so God creates Adam and Eve. Now, he, he, when he did, he had a plan for what they should do once he created them, okay? And he, and, and this, is, this is on Genesis 1, 28, which I, remember I said begins on the first page of the Bible, the dominion mandate? Okay, now look at this scripture. It said, and God blessed them, that's right after he created Adam and Eve. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion. Everybody say dominion. dominion. See, that's, that's what I say. It's on the first page of the Bible. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, every living thing that moves on the earth. What I get from that is that God created Adam and Eve to have dominion over all, everything else he created. So that was, that, that was, that was his plan for this. Now, Adam was to govern, and that means he uh, was to have dominion, and God established this government. Adam didn't establish it, so Adam was to do the governing. But <clears throat> here's the thing about it. Look at that next thing. See, Adam is not just a man's name. In Hebrew, Adam means the whole human race. That's right. So when you think about it, oh, when God created Adam, we were all in there. See? Now that we know more about genetics, every one of us has some of Adam's DNA. That's, 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 that's awesome. In other words, <clears throat> this, the, to have dominion means, means humankind, and that's the dominion mandate. God gave the dominion mandate not only to Adam, but to us. And, but don't forget, Adam was a free moral agent, so he had a choice a choice to obey and take dominion according to God's plan. But not only did he have authority to take dominion, now think about this. I don't know if you ever thought, followed this train of thought. He also had authority to give dominion away because he was a free moral agency. So he, it was up to whom? Wow. It was up to Adam whether he accepted this or not, and he, and he knew the rules of the game, okay? So now we got Adam there, page one of the Bible with a dominion mandate. Now, that brings us to number two. It said there were four of these things to remember. Number two, look at this. The enemy has attacked the dominion mandate since day one. It's very important. And we all know the story, but Satan you know, took the form of a serpent and he went into the Garden of Eden. Now, <clears throat> most of us know, most of us know, I mean, we all know that. Okay? But Satan went into the Garden of Eden for one main reason. And the, that one main reason, now I'm bringing you something new here for most of us, is not what we have heard in most of the sermons we've heard about this. Because most pastors, preachers, preach that Satan went into the Garden of Eden to make Adam and Eve sin, and so that sin gets passed through the whole human race, and that we're sinners, like Adam, because of Adam's fall in the Garden of Eden. Now, none of that's wrong. That was part of it, but I said what Satan's main reason was. <clears throat> okay, now let me explain. Let me explain. Let me explain this one the best I can. Satan's purpose, main purpose, was to usurp the dominion over the world that God had given to Adam. Who was supposed to have dominion? Adam, right? And who went into the Garden of Eden? Satan. And Satan went in for the main purpose of getting that dominion. Because I want to think, I, I, I want to describe Satan now for a few minutes. And most of us know this, but I want to put some of the pieces together. So let's, let's think about what Satan's situation was and why Satan 
wanted to go into the Garden of Eden. Now, you, I think most of us know that God created Satan as an angel of light, right? right. And that, that's angel of light. That's why he, he had the name Lucifer. That means light, okay, light bearer. And so there, there was, and incidentally, not all angels are the same. There are some angels that are bigger, better, fatter, taller, stronger than other angels. <laughs> okay? But what we do know about Satan, about Lucifer, he was one of the greatest of all the angels in heaven, right? Yeah. Some, I heard somebody, somebody, I don't know where they get it, but maybe you would, Jeff, because you're a worship leader, that Satan was the worship leader of heaven. Ever hear that? Yeah. yeah. In Ezekiel 38, you get that? Yeah. But whatever he, whatever he was, he wasn't just an ordinary angel. He was one of the top angels in, in um, heaven. But he made a mistake. He went into rebellion, and he tried to overthrow the government of heaven. <laughs> Didn't work. And as a result, God cast him out of heaven plus a lot of other angels. Some people say a third of the angels went with him at that time. In other words, they got, they got booted out of heaven. And uh, so as a result, <clears throat> now listen to this one. Try to figure this one out. Satan had, in heaven, he had power and authority. God created him as a powerful being and gave him authority, right? Okay, now when Satan was cast out of heaven... He still had his power, but no authority. Can you figure that one out? Let me try to explain it. Uh, just early this year, uh, my wife and I moved from Colorado Springs to Texas. We live in the suburb of Dallas. And uh, uh, when, I was, when we were in Colorado Springs, I had eight acres. We lived in the woods. I mean, we had eight acres of ponderosa pines, and it was our house was seven thousand three hundred feet above sea level, and um, and we lived in the woods. And one of the things about living in the woods is, you know, you have some animals like bears and lions and things like that. <laughs> <coughs> so I always had a gun. Now, I don't know about Tennessee, but I know, Te I know Texas is really oh, yeah, great on guns. Got, got guns in Tennessee? Guns. Yeah. All right. So I'm talking to the right people here. I got the right audience. And I always had a gun, man. And I, I'll tell you what. I had, I had that 20-gauge shotgun within six steps of my bed. And it was always loaded. I don't know how people want guns that aren't loaded. Okay, what do you do with a gun that's not loaded? Anyhow, so that's, you know, that's the way we are. And, and Doris and I, when we set up our house there years ago, we, were mission we, we started our ministry as, for 16 years. Our first 16 years, we were missionaries in Bolivia. And, um, and part of that is in the Andes Mountains, and that's where llamas come from. So we had, we had llamas. We had little pasture land, too, uh, about an acre, and so we had llamas there. And one night, a bear came and killed one of my llamas. Not good. Not good. So that poor bear, within 24 hours, met his final destiny. <laughs> <coughs> And we had permission from the Colorado Department of, of Wildlife to do that. And uh, so he was gone. But uh, the only reason is because I had that shotgun. Now, I tell you, when I had that shotgun in my hand, I had a lot of power. Right? Yeah. Furthermore, on my property in the woods, I, had, I could use it. But if I took that same shotgun into the city of Colorado Springs, get the picture? Yeah. I'd still have the same power in my hands, right? But I wouldn't have what? 
I wouldn't have the authority to use it. Only law enforcement can, has the authority to use uh, weapons like that. So there I am with my shotgun and no authority to use it. It's like, just like being unloaded, you know, no use. I just tell that story because that's what Satan's situation was. Satan still has power because God created him with power. But God withdrew the authority for Satan to use that power. Okay, so that's, this, that, that, that is, that was the situation. Now, that, let's get back to Satan's situation. What then, in that case, did Satan want more than anything else? He wanted to regain his authority, and he wanted to maintain it. Get the picture? I mean, this, is, this isn't rocket science. When you think about it, that's what Satan wanted. See? And that is why Satan approached Adam and Eve, because Satan knew something. He knew that Adam had the power to take his authority but he also had power to give his authority away. Remember, he's a free moral agent, right? It's Adam's choice. Okay. And so he could obey God or he could obey Satan. And we know that Adam made the worst choice. And he decided to obey Satan and not God and to give his dominion to Satan. So that not only put him under the dominion of Satan from the Garden of Eden, but who else did it put under the dominion of Satan? Us. Because don't forget, Adam means humankind. So Adam made a decision for the rest of us to be put under the dominion of Satan. Now the result of this is incredible once we start thinking about it. You know, I tell you what, we, we now live a couple thousand years after Christ. And um, when a lot of us have kind of forgotten about what history was before Jesus came. Do you know that human life was miserable from top to bottom? Human life was miserable before Jesus came. I mean, wars, right now we're, we, we, we regret wars, we hate wars. Uh, that back in that part of history before Jesus came, wars were not, you, you didn't have any choice. You were always at war. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, remember it says that there was a time of year when the kings, the, when the kings were supposed to do what? Go out to war. Out to war. The story of David, and that's a different story, but still that it was normal for all the kings to go out and fight each other in war. And and those were wars were br brutal. I mean, there's even a story in the Bible when somebody captures another, uh, the leader of another army, they gouge their eyes out right in front of them. With no anesthetic or operating room, you know, just, it's, it's just a hook and pull them out. And, you know, we, we, we've got a lot of stuff like that, getting people beheaded on television. But, um, uh, but back then it was much more, it, it was normal, it was part of life. You, Huge percentage of the human race was, a, was slaves. I mean, a big percentage. And this wasn't racial. This wasn't black or white or, any, or Asian or anything like that. Across the earth, more people were slaves than weren't slaves. People bought them and sold them, did whatever they want with them, with, uh, with other human beings. And human sacrifice was common. I mean, we've all heard stories about the Aztecs, you know, and the sacrificing the virgins and the blood running down the, the altars. And um, that was not unusual at all. Life expectancy, take life expectancy, it was short. If you lived to be 30 years old, you lived in, to a good old age. And um, women were scorned. I mean, w many women were treated worse than animals. And nobody cared. That was just the way life life was most most just travel from one city to another was life threatening you had to take like an army with you to travel from one place to another i mean i could go on and on but i tell you what everything in that list i just gave you pleases satan that's right that's that everything gave satan pleasure and 
according to the according to the Bible, Satan is called the God of this age. Now look at that language. I didn't make this up. Satan is called the God of this age. Can we take that seriously? He's called the prince of the power of the air. Now these aren't just careless words. These are very well thought out biblical concepts. And um, Jesus himself, on two occasions, called Satan the ruler of this world. And Satan has come to do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what he, that's what he wants. He wants, to, he, he, he wants to do that. And let's not underestimate Satan. Now, I know a lot of people, when I, when I talk about this, a lot of people, some of you as well, or who are watching this uh, this video, are thinking, you know, we shouldn't talk that much about Satan. In fact, I've heard some preachers preach. We shouldn't say anything about Satan. And uh, they kind of, some people scold me that I'm talking this much about Satan. But I'll tell you what, those who are scolding me forget that the first rule of warfare is to know your enemy. If you don't know your enemy, your enemy's going to defeat you. Okay. And uh, so I believe that we should know our enemy. I mean, take a look, for example, we all know this, but maybe haven't thought of it. Jesus' third temptation. Remember that? He got taken up in the high mountain. <laughs> and Satan says to Jesus, I'm paraphrasing now, he says, he shows Jesus all the kingdoms of this world. That's what it says. Okay. How many? Oh, oh not just 90%. Shows them all the kingdoms of this world. And he says, Jesus, if you'll only worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms and their glory. It says so right in the Bible. Okay. Now, the outcome of the temptation, we know that, that Jesus didn't yield, but that's not my main point. Jesus never questioned Satan's right to offer him the kingdoms. Why? Because Satan had dominion. Where did he get it? He got it in the Garden of Eden from Adam's choice to give his and our dominion away. So, Satan, actually, at this point, the world wasn't turning out the way God had originally planned. Because God didn't plan for Satan to take over dominion. His plan was for Adam to have dominion. But Satan, since Adam was a free moral agent, don't forget, that was the key told you I'd be repeating that a lot, um, uh, Satan was able to do that. Okay, now that brings us to uh, point number three. The second Adam permanently reversed history. Okay, and we know who the Satan, who this, uh, excuse me, we know who the second Adam is. He's called the last Adam, second Adam. That's another name for Jesus Christ. And um, it's interesting, you know, the, I don't, this, this, this is just on, on the side, but um, I don't know if you ever thought, that why is Jesus called the last Adam? Because the first Adam was in the garden, right? It's because... Because Jesus, not, not, let me put it this way, Jesus had a human nature and a divine nature. That's what makes diff Jesus different from the Father and the Holy Spirit. The Father and the Holy Spirit only have one nature, that's a divine nature. Jesus, when he came to earth, he took on what? A human nature. So he was 100% human and 100% God. But and his, but his human nature was created, just like Adam was created. And there's a lot of scripture teaching about this. See? So that's why Jesus is the last Adam, and Satan and uh, Adam. Excuse me, it was the last Adam, and the the human being Adam was the first. All right. 
Now, if you look at this big picture, see that phrase up there? Is it up there? World history has changed 180 degrees twice. Is that up there? Okay. And um, just, just it's, it's, this is easy, but you, most of the time you don't think about it. Okay. So it changed the first time it changed 180 degrees. You know, that's halfway around. Um, when Adam disobeyed God and gave up dominion. Because that wasn't the way world history was supposed to turn out. So it turned 180 degrees. Then it turned the second 180 degrees and came around when Jesus, who's the second Adam, came to turn history back around and retake dominion. Okay. Now it, was, it should be getting a little clearer why we got that great, great commission. To us and the dominion mandate. See? Okay. Now we're not finished yet. Jesus, we we're not. Jesus hasn't taken full dominion, but for two thousand years, I'm going to come back to that again. Things I tell you what, things have changed Absolutely. since Jesus came. Absolutely. But what we have the privilege of is in the very near future seeing things change much more rapidly oh, right. than anyone else has ever seen since Jesus came. That's exactly right. And that's what, that's what is very exciting. Now when you think about it, when you think along these lines, you ask the question, why did Jesus come? And look at what it says in 1 John 3. It says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested <clears throat> that he might destroy the works of the devil. Remember that verse? That's why Jesus came, because the devil had got, been getting away with this, and, and um, Jesus came to turn things around. And here's what one of the things that Jesus himself said in Luke 19, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now that we live in the, in the second apostolic age, there's an interesting contrast that I like to make. Incidentally, I was praying about this, Jeff. I think tomorrow I want to deal with some basic information about apostles and apostolic leadership in my session. Good. Okay? And um, I, we talked about all this previously at breakfast this morning. That's why I'm dialoguing with Jeff. But um, uh, there's a difference between pastoral preaching and apostolic preaching. Now, pastoral preaching in, in this, um, when they say the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost, the, it stresses that Jesus came to die on the cross and shed his blood in order to pay the penalty for our sins so that we, if we accept Jesus Christ by faith, then we can be born again and go to heaven. Right? That's the beginning. I mean, check it out. Check Billy Graham's messages. Yeah, exactly. Tune into any one of them. <laughs> that is there in every single one. With George Beverly Shea. With George Beverly Shea. <laughs> That's a good one. And, um, and sure. And so what they do is they read this scripture as if it says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who were lost, right? Now look at it again. That's not what it says. It says to save that which was lost. And yeah, dominion. So apostolic preaching, apostolic preaching stress takes it literally. So that which was lost was the dominion. So that's what Jesus came to do. And I'm not putting down Billy Graham, understand that. But uh, 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 let's, let's, I mean, uh, I don't know if a few guys here know Joe Matera from New York City. You know, you know him? Okay. So he, he wrote this book. He wrote several books, but this is one of his early books called Ruling in the Gates. He's, a, he's an apostle from uh, Brooklyn, he, but he's, he's a very influential apostle. Isn't that right? And um, so Joe <clears throat> writes this in his book. Now, this is going to surprise you, Okay. And I love it. You'll see why. Okay. Here's the quote. 
He says, the main purpose of Jesus dying on the cross was not so that you can go to heaven. Right. Isn't that shocking? <laughs> it's supposed to be, okay? okay? All right, now here's what he said. The main purpose of his death was so that his kingdom can be established in you so that as a result you can exercise kingdom authority on the earth and reconcile the world back to him. Come on now. See that? That's right. Now, that's a huge difference from the, the pastoral view of that because it's, it talks about uh, taking dominion. And um, I agree. I agree with, uh, with, with Joe Matera with that. And that's, that is, uh, summarizes the dominion mandate. Now, see where he says, the last thing he says, reconcile the world back to him? Let's, let's take a look at uh, reconciliation. That's a f famous word. We all know it. We've all heard it a lot. But let's take a, let's just, let's just think about this for a minute. And how, the God, how God the Father sees this. Okay? Now see that scripture? For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, that's from Jesus, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through his blood on the cross. Okay? Now there's another difference in, in pastoral preaching and apostolic preaching on this verse. The pastoral, the pastoral view is that all things mean all people, all individuals, to reconcile everybody, man, every man and every woman, to God. And uh, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying that the apostolic view of this says that we are to reconcile all of creation by him to reconcile all things. Now, does all things include all people? Yes. So there's nothing wrong with stressing we include all people, as long as we include the rest, which means all the, all the rest of the creation. And that's transformation, or that's dominion. Now, here's one thing. How is this to be accomplished? And you, you've heard most of these scriptures, but, but um, I just want to get them again in front of you. Okay, now it says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. How about that? Now who has the ministry of reconciliation? Okay, now think about that. Jesus paid the price for reconciliation. We didn't pay the price for reconciliation. But Jesus doesn't have the ministry of reconciliation. I know that might be a new thought to some of you. We have the, we, we, we have the ministry of reconciliation. And we couldn't do it without Jesus paying the price. But a lot, of, a lot of us like to pray, Jesus, please reconcile our city to yourself. That prayer doesn't count. God's not going to hear that prayer because that's not God's plan. The way to pray is that God fill us with your spirit and with power and wisdom and revelation so that we can fulfill each one of our individual roles as a team, as the body of Christ, to reconcile this city. Now, I know that's a new thought. God's not going to reconcile it. We're supposed to reconcile it by the power of God. We can't do it with our own power. And through the price that Jesus paid, which is his blood on the cross. And yet, we're supposed to do that. I, I don't know if, you, if uh, you guys are tied in at all with the Kong He in Singapore. Kong He has one of the greatest churches in Asia, one of the greatest churches in the world is called City Harvest Church. And um, he's a, he's a young guy. His church grew to about 30,000. 30, yeah. And I've preached there several times. He, 
Kong, he's an interesting guy because um, you know, he's got one foot in the business mountain and one foot in the religion mountain. We, I didn't t tell you about the seven mountains yet, but still, it's, it's in the workplace. He doesn't take a salary from the church. He, had, he owns seven clothing outlets in Singapore, makes all his money, and pastors this church of 30,000. And um, uh, talk about entrepreneur, because he's the first pastor that ever did this with me. You know, I went over there, and we got a little time, okay? All right, got a little time. Kong, he started this church with his wife, Sun Ho. In Asia, sometimes the wife keeps their maiden name. And but anyways, Kong, he and Sun Ho. And uh, they started a church together in the, in, the, in the house. And then they moved to a hotel room. And they had, keep, had to keep moving because the hotel rooms got too, always got too small. Because the church really, really started growing and growing and growing. And, um, and what, what Kong, he really needed, not, it wasn't just hotel rooms, he needed a worship center. And he needed one at that point to seat 2,000. That's how big the church was. And, and he knew he'd have multiple services, but 2,000 was fine. The problem is in Singapore, getting land is very, very difficult. It's not easy at all to buy property. It's much easier in Murfreesboro <laughs> than it is in Singapore. And uh, so, but he finally found a piece of property. It was going to, so he could build this building, 2,000 uh, seat worship center. And um, then he found out, which he already knew, but he forgot. When he went to get it zoned, to get the building permit, the, they wouldn't give it to him. Because there's a rule in Singapore, some of you have been there, it's a very clean city. There's a rule in Singapore that when you own property, you can only build on 75% uh, on of it. You have to leave 25% green. That's the city nation, because it's a city nation, it's the nation's rule. And so if he only built on 75%, he couldn't get the 2,000 sanctuary, right? Okay. So he decided to do something different. He decided to get some architect to design his whole worship center underground so he could still leave 25% on the ground. And the city gave him permission to do that. So, and I, and I remember the story, they even had some underground parking there. So I, I remember the story that when they poured the cement for that building, it, it became the largest cement pour in the history of Asia up until that time. And uh, so I gained a lot of international notoriety for that. And um, anyway, he got the, he got the building. And, um, but then, oh, okay, so here's the problem. You can guess what the problem would have been, right? Once they finished that sanctuary for 2000, guess what the problem was then? It wasn't big enough. Big enough. Expansion. Yeah. So then he had to lease the, the uh, Singapore Convention Center and at least an auditorium for 8,000. Get the picture now? So here he had this underground sanctuary for 2,000. And on the other side of the city, he had this auditorium leased for uh, 8,000, 8,000. And so, okay, now I'm invited, right? To speak, to do the Sunday morning ministry. Well, they, Sunday morning there for him includes Saturday night. So, on Saturday night, I had to speak first at the underground sanctuary for 2,000, jam-packed. And then I had to drive across Singapore three quarters of an hour and uh, speak in the convention center that, till that night forget what the exact hours were, but it was reasonable. And um, 
But then on Sunday morning, I had to do it just the opposite. I had to speak in a convention center first, and then the underground one second, right? So in other words, four times. Now that's you know, it's quite a load. So I said, um, I said, Kong, you know, is it, would it be okay? Because these are different audiences, right? It's not the same people coming to more than one service. So would it be okay if I do the same message four times? Oh no. <laughs> In other words, he made me do four different messages for one reason. So he could get the four DVDs and market them as a package, see? He's a smart so, man. Yeah, he's a smart man, he's an entrepreneur. See? Well, he's so much of an entrepreneur that they outgrew these, well, and that, which means that the, I, I was there more than one weekend, and every weekend I was, I'd speak to 20,000 people in those units, right, added up. So, um, but it wasn't long before he outgrew all of that. Now, what he did was he, because when you get a church like this, and Singapore is a very prosperous country, incidentally, there's a lot of money in Singapore. A lot of money. And a lot of, a lot of rich people are in his church. And the uh, story of his wife is, I'll, I'll tell the next time I come here sometime, but his, his wife has a more exciting story than Kong Hee. But um, anyway, there's quite a couple. So what he did was he formed this coalition of business people and he purchased the um, SunTech Convention Center, which is one of Singapore's main convention centers, for $200 million. I'm talking about, you know, big time. And that had an auditorium for 16000 And uh, so what he was going to do, he was going to own that, like we were talking, Jamie, about leasing it to the city for their activity, but leasing it to the church on Sundays. And um, he, he got all this done when, you got to understand now, the government of Singapore is really a very good government. There's, there's very little corruption there. And uh, it's, a good, it's a good, fair government, but it's Muslim. Muslims, it's not a Muslim state, you know, like Saudi Arabia, but it's a, it's a how do you say it? There's freedom of religion, but the ruling party is a Muslim party. And um, this Christian church now gets this Suntech Convention Center, and the government woke up. They didn't know that a Christian church was buying this convention center, believe it or not, until they bought it. It's because Kong He was smart enough to form all these corporations without his name, see? It's like you're doing. I mean, you know, he. he and so nobody knew it was a church that bought it, except the people, you get the picture, right. who are on the inside. So but once they discovered it, they, set, they, 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 they actually indicted him. They, they found ways of getting to him. He didn't go to jail. No, not yet. They have, the, that has been, it's all being tried. And, uh, of course, they have good attorneys on both sides. But uh, the, get that, the city, the nation, got blindsided by this. And Kong Hee, so far, so good. I mean, it's been about three years since this, because this is one of the biggest cases in the whole history of Singapore yeah. for this Christian church, for Kong Hee, to lead this thing. And so um, we've kept in touch, and, uh, and he's gone through it, and it looks right now like he's going to win. I'm not saying he does. Let's not clap yet. But it looks, it looks ver things are very hopeful. Okay. Anyway, this is the kind of person he is. So if you hear about Kong, he, you know, on the Internet or from some people who don't like him, they're going to say, you know, he's indicted for 
I don't know what the, whatever the charge was. Racketeering. Racketeering, is that what it was? Yeah, racketeering. And, uh, but it's not settled yet. Okay, so I just wanted you to get this back, because he understands, think about it. taking dominion in a nation of Singapore, owning that central landmark convention center, that's part of what we're talking about, taking dominion. See? And um, anyhow, here's what Kong, he says. He says there's a difference between lifeboat theology and ark theology. See the words up there? Okay, here's the way it goes. Unfortunately, many of us hold on to this mentality that since sin has already damaged the world, what's important now is to rescue as many people as we can from this wreckage. One preacher called this lifeboat theology, looking at the world as if, if it is the ship Titanic. The correct Christian worldview is never the lifeboat theology, but the ark theology. Noah's ark is only, Noah's ark not only saved people, it preserved all of God's creation. See the difference? It brought everything back out to restore the earth. And he said, every church must be like Noah's Ark, drawing people in for discipleship, then sending them out to Amen. restore the world. Come on. Now look at the end of that. Drawing people in for discipleship and sending them out to restore the world. See, now that's what Global Fire does. We have one of the, one of the, I thought I was all through this because I thought I was getting too old. But um, one of the things I've been doing all my life is sort of organizing things and starting new phases of ministry. And um, in, in, uh, Jeff mentioned it when he introduced me, but one of the latest ones that God is bringing to the surface, we, so we didn't design this at all. He's just observing what God is doing. As he's raising up, instead, in many cases, I'm not saying everyone, in many cases he's transforming traditional local churches into apostolic centers. That's right. That's right. Hear that terminology? Yeah. Traditional local churches into apostolic centers. doesn't mean local churches are wrong. There's nothing wrong with them. But some of them are becoming apostolic centers in which... Uh, Kong, he says, it's, it's uh, drawing people from discipleship and then sending them out. So the main, the main object of, of um, Global Fire is not to build a strong congregation. The main object of Global Fire is a kingdom vision to send people out to expand the kingdom of God. And having a good, strong local congregation is a, is a positive. Absolutely. It's going to help it all happen. But that's not the, that's a means toward the end. Big difference in thinking, because most of us have come from the type of church where what everyone's focused on the, on the needs of the church and the congregation instead of the kingdom. Okay? And so that's why, that's why we believe in, in uh, lifeboat theology, which brings us to point number four. And this is the last, this is the last point. And it's repeating some of the things I introduced already in, in number three, but look at this now. Jesus delegated establishing his kingdom to us. Okay? So, and we all know this, that Jesus trained his disciples to take charge when he left. He knew he was going to leave, and he trained his disciples to take over. And we all know Acts 1.8, because, incidentally, did you know that Acts 1-8 were Jesus' last words spoken on the face of the earth? Not on the cross, it is finished. Those weren't his last words. The last words were Acts 1-8. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, where he said, but you shall receive power. Who's that? His disciples. That includes you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, what do you think Jesus meant by my witnesses? Okay. 
witnesses were to speak and to act on Jesus' behalf. That's right. What we speak and what we act should exactly reflect what Jesus would do. Exactly. Now, I know we fall short, but that's not what our idea isn't to fall short. Our idea is to do it, to do this. Amen. And so what, 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 was, what, what were Jesus' priorities? Okay, well, he gives them. And um, this is in, in Luke chapter 4. Now, this, is, this, this scripture, let me explain it here. I put Jesus, the words Jesus' agenda. But, uh, you know, Jesus came and, and, uh, and he was baptized and tempted and, and he started preaching. And he, he preached in, in many different places and healed the sick and cast out demons and uh, probably gave a lot of public talks. But the first public talk of Jesus that we have recorded in the Bible is when he went back to his hometown of Nazareth. And you remember he was in the synagogue of Nazareth? Okay. And here's what, yeah, here's what he says. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's, I've, I'm always really quite fascinated by the first thing on Jesus' list of his agenda when he announced it publicly. Preach the gospel to the poor. Now think of that word gospel. The word gospel means good news. You know that, right? So Jesus said, the main thing that I've come for is to preach Good news to the poor. Now, if you're poor, what's the best news you could possibly hear? Just you're not going to be poor anymore. You're going to be prosperous, right? Think about that. That's what Jesus came for. So he focused on poverty. And he said, I have come to preach good news. Is it God's will that you be poor? No. It's God's will that you be prosperous. And, um, uh, and those of us who are, who, and the fact that I have it in my book, On Earth As It Is In Heaven, those of us who are following these lines of dominion mandate and social transformation, we have an agreement among us that the, how shall I say it, the final measurement, because look, if we have some objectives and some goals, there's no use even having them if we can't measure whether we accomplish them or not. You know, we, we, and, and so we agree on this. But the final measurement of whether a certain social group is transformed or not is, and these are technical terms, the eradication of systemic poverty. I'll repeat that. The eradication of systemic poverty. Don't, don't miss understand that word. I didn't say systematic poverty. I said systemic poverty. The difference is when you use the word systemic, it means the social system. There are some places and the, there are some social systems where if you're born in that social system, yeah, that's right. you're going to be poor. That's right. right? We have some of those places in America. Right. Too many. And we have those. So if we're going to transform America, we're going to get rid of that. We're going to have systemic prosperity. That's right, amen. Which means what? If you're born into a certain social situation, you're going to prosper. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I think if, I, if, I, if my information is correct, we've only had two nations in the world that have had a systemic um, prosperity and that is uh, Singapore and Japan now Japan's falling off a little bit but they still got it and, uh, and, there's, uh, and, and incidentally it's kind of embarrassing but neither one of those countries is led by a Christian and yet the kingdom value of systemic prosperity is there and, but we want to see it multiplied 
And we want to see the leadership, the head, not the tail, the head as Christians and the kingdom of God. Anyway, I don't want to get this too uh, complicated here, but um, I just sort of deviated by talking about preaching the gospel of the poor. Then what else? He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. See that? Preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Look at that scripture. Every single part of that scripture upsets the devil. The devil hates every part of that. And yet that's the agenda that Jesus sent forth. But, you see, what Jesus brought is a new kingdom. That's right. He, I, I mentioned this a, a little while ago, but he brought a new kingdom which is called in the Bible the kingdom of God, right? You don't see the kingdom of God mentioned in the Old Testament. Not there. Because it came with whom? It came with Jesus. And Jesus brought a new kingdom. See, because in what I described, all that miserable life in the, before Jesus came, that was the kingdom of Satan. He was steal, kill, and to destroy. That's the way human life was. When Jesus came, then he, uh, he turned this around and brought the kingdom of God. So for the first time then since the Garden of Eden, Satan suffered an invasion of his kingdom. See, that what I, see what I mean? So that's why things have been changing so much. So Jesus has been using his witnesses to do this. Remember, right. you shall be my witnesses. Right. And he's using his witness to build his church. Right. He's using his witnesses to advance his kingdom. And he's using his witnesses to reconcile more and more of creation to himself. And Satan has been losing ground for 2,000 years. But I'll tell you what, the process is about to speed up. And I'll say this prophetically, even though you don't hear a lot of prophecy from me, but I'm, I'm confident of this, that Satan, I think I've got it up here, Satan will lose more ground in the next 100 years than in the past 2,000 years. You see? And a lot of us are going to be part of this. I mean, you know, next 100 years, well, I don't think I have quite that long. But uh, at least I'm around here to help kick it off. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do this afternoon. And, and the devil well, came here a little too early on the screen. But it says, the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has, what, short time. He knows his time is limited now. He didn't have to do that before, but now he is. He's got a short time. So why, why do I say that I think that, that, um, that this process is speeding up? And I'll just conclude with this. <coughs> um, and I'll go into this more tomorrow afternoon, but I believe that the year 2001 is the year that we, at least we in North America, can mark the beginning of our second apostolic age. The first apostolic age was in the Bible times, and maybe two or three hundred years after that. But in the second apostolic age, I believe it started in 2001, I believe there was a lead up to it, probably since World War II, but I'll may, may go into that more, uh, more tomorrow. But now that we're aligned with po apostles and prophets, that's the new apostolic age, the, um, we're, we're equipped to win the war. We've, we've never been as equipped to win this war and to make progress as we are now. And 2001 isn't very long ago. What is it? It would be uh, 14 years ago. And most of us are, have been through this whole thing. So the, and we're equipped to win the war. So this war has two major fronts that we have to concentrate on winning. One is the spiritual front. And um, here's what the Bible says. We must stand against the wiles of the devil. 
and what are his wiles? His wiles are whatever it takes to maintain the dominion that he usurped from Adam. So that's, that, that is what is, uh, the war is, and this means what? Spiritual warfare. Like Paul said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness. And um, so that is, uh, that is the front, uh, I call it the spiritual front. Then we have a natural front. And this is the new cutting age for this generation. Those of you who are, who, 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 I'm talking to most of the people here in this conference, are ones that don't want to sit around and watch everything happen. You want to be on the front lines helping to make things happen. And, uh, and so this is the exciting part because this is, all of this stuff is relatively new to us who are, you know, most of us are good, solid, believing, traditional Christians. But now we've got a new wineskin. And so those of us who want to be in the new wineskin, we're going to begin to learn how to do uh, new things. And some of the powerful concepts that God is giving us is the 7M mandate. 7M stands for the seven mountains or the seven molders of culture. So if we're going to change culture, we, have to, we, we can't just change culture in general. It's, 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 too, it's too big. But we can change the seven molders of culture. So let me just show you what they are so we can keep them in mind. Religion, family, education, government, media, arts and entertainment, and business. And when all of these are activated, look what, it, look what it leads to. The kingdom of our God. And there's a lot more to say about those things, but um, that's one of the things that God is showing us. And then another thing is the church and the workplace. And uh, that's very, very important, especially for those of you who are not in the religion mountain, but who are in one of the other mountains, how that actually what you do in that mountain is a form of ministry. And that's a whole other teaching, but God is showing us that. And then God is also showing us about apostles in the workplace. And we, we're used to apostles, most of us are now used to apostles in the religion mountain, but how about apostles in the other mountains? Could there be any? And my answer is, yes, there are. And uh, so I'd like to... Um, uh, I, I, I like to, I truly believe in that. And then the, the, the other one is the crucial role of wealth. And uh, I'll tell you what, we're not going to see sustained social transformation in cities or nations without controlling vast amounts of wealth. I mean, this, this, co this, will, this will and is costing us all, more money than we're used to handling. But we've got to get used to handling it. Right. And I believe that uh, really God, <clears throat> excuse me, I really believe that God wants his, doesn't want his people poor. I believe that God wants his people rich. Amen. So God is a God of prosperity. He's not a God of poverty. And uh, so this is an enormous assignment, you know. Yeah, it is. And so the question is, are we up to it? Can we handle it? Yes. God is giving us the assignment, yeah. and we have to decide that if we're going to meet the challenge. Or, you know, we can, because we're free moral agents, we can sit back and enjoy God and have, you know, have a good time, meet with believers, get excited, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and go to heaven. Or we can do all of that above, but we can also be part of this challenge of being witnesses to Jesus and fulfilling that mandate. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Yeah. That, uh